relation with other humans, in relation with like other species and this rock that we're on right now. Like get your house in order. My gosh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and actually at 1.35 a.m., the moon moves into Sagittarius. So get on it. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. We need some Sag energy up in here. That's, it's, it's time for a Sagittarius moon in spring. So, anyway, yeah. It's very intense. We're going to go again. And we're very, we're gar we're gardening all weekend, and and one of the things we're very conscious of this year is all, and we have been, is like all of our pollinator plants. Yeah. Um. So I really identified, I think, for the first time ever, like with the Q-tip in the, in the flowers. <laughs> you, had, um, you had to do that. I had to year. do that yeah. last year. I was like, where are the bees? Um. You know. Just, uh. So. This year there will be an abundance of, of pollinating we have flowers. A bunch of new yeah. Perennials. New perennials coming in. And anyway, it's just necessary that those films are, are made and shown and people even understand what it means to do that. Because most people wouldn't. They're like, why are they know? putting, why are they putting a cube in there? Is it in here? Is it in here? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> you know, no, that's what makes your cucumber grow. So I um for the last three years, I've been trying to plant a bee garden every year, but I feel so culpable for my just stupidity. Last year, I cleared everything before winter, but I should have left it for things to overwinter. So I just, I've been feeling really bad every time I stare at this empty patch that should have been stems and dried elements for things to sleep in during the cold months so i've been feeling really bad well you yeah. know now i mean like you know it takes a while uh, to get used to, to tending to those things i mean we foolishly cleared out a bunch of leaves and one time we left too many um i think when you're dealing with this you know we came up from georgia obviously you know that but Trying to figure out what to do with more huge snow cover here is a totally different game. Um, so we things haven't grown as well, I think, as we wanted them to. Yeah, we've been learning. Mm -hmm. But talk about the talk about yeah, tell us tell us some things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so for recording posterity, I guess I'm Janelle Vanderkellen. I'm one of the curators of tonight's program. And I am Taka Suzuki, and I was telling Mike earlier that today's Zoom call, um, it's going to be a little, maybe more scatterbrained because uh, I'm starting to feel the post-second vaccine, like, brain fog kicking in, so. <laughs> it's perfect, because tonight's program, not perfect, not perfect. I want you to have that. It sounded so callous. <laughs> but, um... Tonight's program deals a lot with particulates, which is kind of interesting, especially the last two days. <laughs> yep. Yeah, uh, but tonight's program um, films um, grouped under the name Biopoesis. Um, and Taka and I selected, oops, I think my connection might be unstable. Yeah, I think Janelle, too, you're echoing a little bit. I don't know if you're close to the wall. No, I'm echoing too. But no, I'm hearing that too. Wait, hmm. I don't think it's hold on. I don't think it's me because I've switched headphones. Okay. If I talk now, do I sound normal? <laughs> I do. Okay, cool. Um, but we chose the title of Biopoesis because it's this um concept that's kind of been present over the last 400 500 years anytime humans tried to think through how did life evolve or how did life spring forth um so biopoesis is this concept that life can come from the inorganic or the inert um, and we were interested in this title because a lot of the films in the tonight 
deal directly with um, how humans do relate to plant matter or inorganic matter that we in our hubris and in our very human centric thought process have labeled um, inert without agency or non-living. Um, these films are also grouped because they focus on some of the problematic ways that we have become so self-centered <laughs> when relating to things that are not ourselves. Um, one of the huge issues when we are considering how we as humans are in the world is the fact that we are simply too small or too big or too fast or too slow when trying to observe scientifically what goes on. Uh, when we look at a mountain, we are incapable due to our sensory components uh, of identifying it as a moving thing, a thing potentially that is capable even of communication potentially if we stretch our imaginations a little bit. As the rock moves over many eons, our lives are a blip, so we are unable to engage that as a living thing or as a thing with agency. And the same goes for plants and even some animals as well. Uh, so these films are grouped because in a lot of ways, they all enter into time-based media, whether animation or uh, video manipulation, as a sensory prosthetic that allows us as humans to engage elements around us uh, and identify potential moments of relation that are not tied to domination, subjugation, um, or capitalistic um, desire to exploit, potentially, which is often the way that we enter into modes of relation. Um, when thinking about these films, another uh, thing that kind of guided my relationship to them and my understanding of how these four filmmakers were thinking about communion uh, and relationship with the natural conversation with a stone um, by a Polish poet. Uh, I'm Polish, so you think I would be able to say this, but Wisława, um Szymborska, Szymborska, um, 1996 Nobel Laureate for Literature um, or Nobel Prize winner. Um, so a Conversation with a Stone is this really beautiful moment where uh, imagination is expanded in order to allow for a conversation where a human being is just constantly peppering a stone with requests to be able to enter into the earth. Uh, and to relate in a way um, that is very surrealist, um, but also just heartbreakingly literal. Um, so I did want to read Conversation with a Stone, if you'll allow me. Are we up for it? Okay. Um, I'm going to drop a link to the poem in the chat as well, because it's always more pleasant to follow along than to just hear somebody read. So there's the link for Conversation with a Stone helpfully provided by the LA Times. Conversation with the stone. I knock at the stone's front door. It's only me, let me come in. I want to enter your insides, have a look around. Breathe my fill of you. Go away, says the stone. I'm shut tight. Even if you break me to pieces, we'll all still be closed. You can grind us to sand. We still won't let you in. I knock at the stone's front door. It's only me, let me come in. I've come out of pure curiosity. Only life can quench it. I mean to stroll through your palace, then go calling on a leaf, a drop of water. I don't have much time. My mortality should touch you. I'm made of stone, says the stone, and must therefore keep a straight face. Go away. I don't have the muscles to laugh. I knock at the stone's front door. It's only me, let me come in. I hear you have great empty halls inside you, unseen, their beauty in vain, <laughs> soundless, not echoing anyone's steps. 
admit you don't know them well yourself. Great and empty, true enough, says the stone, but there isn't any room. Beautiful, perhaps, but not to the taste of your poor senses. You may get to know me, but you'll never know me through. My whole surface is turned towards you, all my insides turned away. I knock at the stone's front door. It's only me, let me come in. I don't seek refuge for eternity. I'm not unhappy, I'm not homeless. My world is worth returning to. I'll enter and exit empty-handed. And my proof I was there will only be words, which no one will believe. You shall not enter, says the stone. You lack the sense of taking part. No other sense can make up for your missing sense of taking part. Even sight heightened to become all seeing will do you no good without a sense of taking part. You shall not enter. You have only a sense of what that sense should be. Only its seed, imagination. I knock at the stone's front door. It's only me, let me come in. I haven't got 2,000 centuries, so let me come under your roof. If you don't believe me, says the stone, just ask the leaf, it will tell you the same. Ask a drop of water, it will say what the leaf has said. And finally, ask a hair from your own head. I am bursting with laughter. Yes, laughter, vast laughter, although I don't know how to laugh. I knock at the stone's front door. It's only me, let me come in. I don't have a door, says the stone. So that was Conversation with a Stone. Um, and I absolutely love this poem. Uh, and I think it's very, uh, it's a very good example of a lot of the themes present here. We have concepts of human centricism, that color, uh, our sign directly in front of us uh, and also cause us to identify forms of life as things that look similar to us. Um, we have problematic connection, um, connection that are surrealist and absurdist and childlike in nature. Um, and we also have this concept of time, the fact that our presence on earth as human beings is so painfully short. <sighs> Taka, should we start talking about um, the films one by one, or did you have anything else that you wanted to add about some general themes or the title? Uh, I mean, I think in a strange way, um, the our May program is a little is going to be a little different, but um, tone like thematically and tonally, I think in a weird way starting with Anouk's to what we had um, last month with In the Land Breathe Back, Breathes Back to this program. I mean, in a weird way, we're sort of hearkening back to similar conversations or threads. And, and like there, there are, it, this, I think, season has been a little different in which we've sort of interwoven um, themes and um, topics through um the three programs thus far so i think yeah um as we're talking about stuff we might you know revisit some of those um prior conversations we've had too yeah i think a nuke definitely is in conversation with the films tonight um but biopoesis starts out with uh are you tired of forever by caitlin craigs um and here we have a sensory surrealism um, and almost a childlike learning anew that's being entered into. Um, this piece definitely uses sound cues and animation as a way to uh, surprise and abstract the body. Um, one of the reasons why I love this film so very much is because we kind of uh, have this idea of the self, oops, I'm echoing again, as a very fragmented being and also one that is um, addressed in terms of surface. We have kind of this obsession both with paper um, prosthetics on the hand that confuse the object subject boundary. Is this a human object? Is it an orange that's going to be peeled and eaten? Um, but then we also have this focus on hair or stand-ins for hair and kind of this removal um, of this surface element. So we have lovely moments where sprinkles form a beard on the face. We have drawn on moments and instances of leg hair. 
uh, and then also dryer lint for armpit hair. Um, so these are also markers that are frequently very gendered. Um, so when thinking about this piece in particular, uh, I was I was thinking a lot about narrative structure um, and Ursula Le Guin's um, carrier bag theory of fiction, uh, in which Le Guin kind of uh, takes to task very historic modes of narrativizing that tend to be predicated on um, what she calls kind of this uh, spear or this phallic moment where uh, some sort of club or other element is used to cause chaos or discord that must be overcome. Um, so we know in, in narrative structure there is often some sort of conflict that has to be righted or changed or um, brought into accord. But with the carrier bag theory of fiction, we're gathering, gathering, gathering. Um, rather than being in dissonance with something else, we have a relationship that's being formed uh, through kind of a both and mentality. And I definitely see that present in Caitlin's work here and also in um, Ostara as well, the second film in the program. Um, one other thing about Caitlin's Craig, uh, Caitlin Craig's Are You Tired of Forever is this beautiful, um, absurdist literalism that's entered into through animation, uh, and through play with objects and certain very strongly of um, the literalism of works by artists like Bruce Nauman in the early days of video art. Um, Nauman has this fantastic piece called Waxing Hot, uh, which was an early color photograph um, in which we see Nauman's hands literally waxing the word hot. Um, so of course, Waxing Hot is um, a phrase that's often used, maybe not so much today, but in past, definitely. Um, and as Caitlin kind of engages the body and engages relationships with a spider or with a plant, um, we, we see these contexts and these relationships kind of pushed to an absurdist, but a logical end. Um, and I definitely see in this piece kind of a childlike play, both with what the self can be, uh, and also how one could relate to other objects or beings. Taka, did you want to um, talk any more about Caitlin's work before we move on? Yeah, sure. Um, I think for me, um, when thinking about the order of the first two works, um, it sort of made sense, um, I think, in terms of um, thinking about like mythology and especially creation mythology. Um, it, it tends to start in these liminal spaces and where sort of the only thing that is certain is uncertainty. Um, and that's sort of where uh, Caitlin's piece starts is, you know, uh, it, it sort of has that Sisyphean myth of like, I think, repeating the same task over and over and over again. And then eventually you sort of build that certainty of, oh, this is just going to keep going on forever. I'm never going to end this cycle. Um, but I think there's something there in, in the notion of starting in this space where, it, you know, it, it's almost like a, a dream world where we're not sure if this is an actual lived state of being or something maybe of a different realm. Um, and I think in that way, um, transitioning into um, Ostera, where I, uh, Mary Evans herself calls it a psychic landscape. Um, so I think in that way, tying those two pieces um, in, in sort of this area of the psychic space of whether what we're watching is, you know, the first iteration, the second iteration, or the 50th iteration of the same cycle, um, we're not really quite sure. But um, we also know, um, you know, in, in the notion of Ostera that um, through this sort of blessing from the spring goddess um, that 
it it's eventually going to spring forth into this bloom. Um, so uh, in that in that way, I think um, you know it, it's it's the idea of um, again what Janelle was talking about in terms of um, who actually has agency or authorship, um, whether it's you know the human, the artist, or the land. Um, in that way, I think. Um, the notion of the psychic landscape is sort of questioning and bringing into uh, consideration the fact that perhaps, you know, while we keep going through these cycles, it's actually the the land or perhaps Ostera, the, the, the goddess of spring, who has this foresight of what this landscape is eventually going to become. Um, and I think, you know, as the program goes back, um, I kind of see it as almost like every other piece sort of has a callback. So, um, uh, aerosol, parasol jump, I feel has a little bit of a, um, a callback to, um, are you tired of forever? And, um, Ostera has a little bit of a callback to, um, between wind and water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely see them as being paired. Um, and I love how you described, um, Ostara and also, uh, are you tired of forever as kind of these creation myths? Um, because even in Are You Tired of Forever, we have these fantastic lines and musings, like being a child is painful. <laughs> um, so there's a, a reckoning almost with how one learns the world and how one learns to relate. Um, but while Ostara is kind of this moment of blessing um, or this reclamation of the goddess, which is often tied to the earth, um, I constantly was drawn in that piece to the fact that goddesses and goddess tropes, which were pushed away to make room for the church um, and this, this very masculinist mindset, um, but they were always two-sided. And in this film, we definitely see a doubling. Um, we see a, a giving birth of a figure that is similar to oneself with this fantastic gilded hair. Um, and I was actually really reminded of um, mid-century uh, cinema from the Indian subcontinent, uh, where the mother figure was very much grappling with the role of women in society during a very changeable time. And in films like Mother India, we saw the mother being both a life giver and also a vengeful life taker, one who was able to encompass all sides of male gods that could only be vengeful or could only be gracious and be able to encompass them in one coherent whole. Um, so I, I think one of the reasons why we also uh, placed Ostara directly after Caitlin Craig's work is because within Caitlin's work, there's kind of a, a cacophony of self um, and a distribution of selves. And here we see the culmination um, and potentially not necessarily a coherent whole, but at least a, a balanced or a healthier whole being formed. Um, some of the markers that are present in this really fantastic DIY film um, are those wonderful blue hands with the red talons, um, the crushing of the egg, so giving life uh, while also taking it. Um, and then these fantastic uh, petri dishes almost in the surface uh, of the land where again we kind of see that carrier bag or that um, uh, container element being present. This film is simply littered with containers whether it be the shell of an egg itself. Um, so Taka I think you're absolutely right so many callbacks and so many interweavings um, even just within those two films. Um, these two definitely were dealing with um, how the human relates to oneself and how we get our house in order, which is language that I was using a little bit earlier before we started recording. Um, how do we as humans kind of identify ourselves and um, accept ourselves and past sins in order to move forward into a healthier environmental relation? Um, the final two films, however, function quite differently um, and are tied by different themes. We kind of have this um, consideration of two issues 
environmental issues that are definitely connected, uh, but different. Um, in aerosol parasol jump, we have this preoccupation with um, humans entering into the process of pollination. Um, and this film very much calls into question through the imagery and also the use of stock footage, uh, the fact that humans feel very alien in this process. Um, the artist refers to <laughs> these uh, Q-tips entering the screen as um, brushing, excuse me, uh, brushing, poking and caressing both the flowers on screen and also the screen itself. Um, so we see humans entering into this process and feeling very alien and being a necessity, uh, partially because our actions as human beings have limited uh, the pollinators available to do this job normally. And then in the final film of the program, we have Between Wind and Water, uh, which is preoccupied by um, water issues and water rights, uh, specifically in the American Southwest. Both films are also tied by a relationship of um, particulates. We see pollen in the first film and then also dust in the second. Um, so both very great markers of environmental decline or um, both films also potentially point to the fact that this may not be decline, it may be cycling where we, we die out. <laughs> the earth will be fine and it will right itself. Both speak to deep time in very powerful ways. Um, so those are some of the broader themes. Taka, did you wanna um, pick up with either of those? Yeah, um, yeah, and I think uh, just jumping back to Astara, like, I mean, for me, um, I'm not super uh, familiar with sort of the pagan um, agricultural calendar, um, but um, just, I mean, we, you know, sort of doing cursory research around it. Like for me, one of the, the nice surprises was like for me, I finally discovered or realized the origin of the Easter bunny um, and why, um, because Ostara, I mean, in in the goddess and like the mythology, the figures are usually eggs and a rabbit. So for me, I was like, that's where it comes from. So I, I so that was one of the happy discoveries for me was uh, through doing my uh, research on, yeah, the, the cycle in the calendar there. Yeah. It's a good yeah. <laughs> so yeah, oh yeah. And then, um, Going into uh, yeah aerosol parasol jump, um, I think this is where again with human intervention, I think particularly technology, um, which again is sort of where um, the callback to prior programs with Anuks and considering the Anthropocene um, and the fragility of hum like he not just humanity, but I think human intervention, um, I think comes into play here where. Um, you know, with the Q-tip and the pollinating and this idea of trying to to have more control over these natural processes, um, trying to limit um, pests and infestations or trying to create a more perfect crop um, in a weird way. And this ties back to um, Caitlin Craig's piece. Um, we're kind of entering that Sisyphean cycle where again, it kind of becomes a, the Q-tip pollinating kind of becomes this violent act um, but at the same time it, it sort of becomes this this endless cycle of you know in trying to create more control we're just having to constantly do the same task over and over and over again um, and then it just becomes this never-ending loop um, and I think that sort of gets accentuated when the the video starts to layer um, that footage and stack the flowers on top of flowers on top of flowers and um, that way um, it really uh, becomes a, a strangely I mean caressing but also violent um, act so I think that in the choice of words of caress and poke and brush I think you know poke I mean can be a gentle, but also quite a, a harsh and violent act too. Um, so um, in that way, yeah, um, it, 
it becomes a strange question of, you know, what are we actually doing by intervening and trying to perfect or quote unquote benefit, um, you know, agricultural production. Um, and I think uh, starting with the drone and as more of this uh, digital technological intervention happens, it also weirdly becomes a sterilization process. Um, and we, we do see, you know, the the hand sanitizer and the the aerosol sprays um, and th this notion of disinfectant and pesticides. Um, so um, through this technological intervention um, of you know of trying to again achieve greater control or to to limit uh, imperfections, we're actually creating a much more sterile and uh, almost impossible landscape to live in, um, which again, you know, calls back the notion of the Anthropocene and um, the, the idea that, you know, at a certain point, humanity and all this human intervention, um, we need to realize that we're actually creating a really fragile um, and uh, in a weird way, an insufferable uh, landscape. And it's, it's eventually gonna lead to uh, demise rather than uh, prosper um so um yeah so again it, it, it's, a, it's a weird and harsh turn to take especially after um this the the film um where we sort of get this uh springtime blessing um but i think in a weird way i think you know it it, it does sort of point to the fact of the larger picture that sometimes you know humans take this really amazing gift and then end up just messing it up or just absolutely ruining everything so um so it's a, it's a strange turn to take but it felt appropriate um and then um ending with between wind and water um you know it, it sort of becomes um the the land sort of taking things back a little bit um because as much as um a lot of the the imagery and um in Isabella's piece, it, it turns from this lush manicured landscape to these barren deserts. Um, almost every single time we see the barren desert, it always breathes back with water or with a, a re rejuvenated landscape. Um, and I think in that way, uh, thinking about the pairings of being every other uh, piece, um, this one sort of harkens back to Ostera and the notion of the psychic landscape and why is this sort of springtime uh, like blessing piece filmed in Joshua Tree, which is a barren desert. Um, and the notion of the psychic landscape is thinking about um, the notion that while, yes, currently it is a barren desert, the land and this goddess knowing that eventually it's going to come back and breathe back maybe when humans aren't around anymore, but the land will always come back and, and bring back, um, that sort of, uh, needed or necessary landscape for life to, to, to benefit. Um, so I think in that weird way, um, it, it does, um, cycle back. It does, um, while the imagery is somewhat uh somewhat dark and ominous um i think it does also have a little bit of a hopeful end um, while it may not include humans um it is this notion that you know eventually the land writes itself um so one and potentially in order for the land to write itself it means that the humans need to give up a little bit of their agency, need to give up a little bit of their control and allow the land and allow nature itself to operate on its terms and, and author what it needs to be. So, yeah. So while it takes a dark turn, I, I kind of feel like the last piece between wind, wind and water is actually kind of a nice intermediary where we kind of start to build that balance between, um, yeah, doom and gloom and uh, happy and lush landscape. Yes. 
Um, I'm really glad that you brought up the site Taka because I, I, I think that's another facet that's present in, in these pairings um, is the American Southwest and specifically the stories that have played out there. Um, I, I found it absolutely intriguing that Mary was enacting um, what she identified as uh, European concepts of the Earth Goddess in the American Southwest. Um, I was fascinated by that pairing, and I think it potentially, specifically in the location of Joshua Tree, um, also speaks to um, European colonization and the control that has been present in some of those human-centric narratives and the ways that they have played out with imperialism on the larger um, environment that we as a whole inhabit. Um, so I think that piece potentially speaks pretty um, intrinsically to the connection between environmental degradation and hope springing anew uh, by repaired human relationships and the tie between, um, uh, I don't want to say racial justice, but justice on the human level being tied to environmental justice as well. Um, and then by closing out with um, Between Wind and Water, the two sites that were chosen were golf courses in Palm Springs. Um, and then, what was it? The Salton uh, Sea. The Salton Sea, uh, which has been called the biggest environmental disaster of Californian history. Um, and the Salton Sea in particular is um, a mass of water uh, that has a history of being tied directly to uh, unnatural agrarian processes um, and which has grown or shrank uh, depending on uh, the whims and uh, desires of um, farmers in the area. So again, um, a history where aerosolization, these, these particulates and these dust particles in the air have caused uh, huge problems for predominantly um, Latinx populations. Um, that's part of this story and that's part of this site. Uh, so again, we see human relations being tied to larger environmental relations as well. Um, yeah, happy Easter, everyone. <laughs> Should I go get an egg and smash it? Yeah, that would be an appropriate end. <laughs> yeah. Um, to all of this. That was, it was wonderful to hear you talk about the films, um, especially like the, I think, particularly like the tying of um, Ostara to like, because Ostara feels like the connective tissue, like to me, like there's, it does feel like there's a first half and a second half, but I can't imagine all four of those, I can't, I can't imagine the, the first and the third and the fourth without Ostara mm -hmm. where it is. It provides this, um, this connection, but really interesting to think about the blessing not being, even though we're seeing an anthropomorphic version of a goddess, that the goddess is not necessarily blessing human beings, but actually blessing the earth itself. Um, and its blessing might be to not have humans. <laughs> yeah well and it introduces like all of the the sort of um seemingly on the surface like absurd juxtapositions between what humans are and what they do and the land itself um and it, it brings in the spiritual practice like all the way down to the body like actually clashing with the land and then we move into the, i'm obsessed with the q-tip i'm sorry i'm obsessed with it um and i keep thinking you know the odd moment in which like okay so what is the q-tip's original purpose just like you stick it in your ear so that you can so you, hear better you know, hear better and <laughs> get things up but you know then it's like well you think about the moment where the q-tip is used on the side of the computer mm -hmm. and it's again it's a cleaning a cleaning thing yeah. but then this this other motion where it becomes like the actual pollinator like the replacement it's like the accidental purpose of the q-tip um, which is like the accidental purpose of what happens with like all these these 
Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I have to think oh, have for a hundred hours, have... like the goddesses, like changing and 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 becoming assimilated into this land through like European colonialism. It's it's insane. Honestly, the other thing, it's <laughs> the so the Q-tip too. I think one thing I want to just following what you're saying, you know, it having this cleaning purpose originally and it being used on a computer. And there's those, what you're talking about too, about this like sterilization that humans bring to everything mm -hmm. and, and trying to perform this like awkward, like pollination. And like, there's a way in which it's like, I don't know, it's bringing, it's bringing along with it sterilization. It's bringing around, it bringing that concept with it by using a Q-tip. But then also I feel like um, it feels so desperate. Like, like there's this like human desperation. The q, in the q is always desperate. But all like, the technology yeah. is like, there's a way in which like all of it is, is like there, these are just like acts of human de desperation that um, arise like the, I don't know that we're kind of like oscillating between this like hubris thinking that we can do everything and desperation realizing we can't um, but constantly kind of going back through back and forth between these these mindsets that are, are really unhealthy and that are so human centric mm -hmm. um, yeah I sorry. think and, oh sorry yeah and like I think the the one image that really drives that home is like after all the q-tip imagery we see this collapsed and sleeping human figure lying down on the bed and right next to it trapped in the cage of the computer is the natural pollinator just oh. roaming around oh i know that's so brilliant and i think the Actually. the whole program like it started to culminate in that that final image in of wind and water where like the the new water comes in to crash upon the cracked land and i'm thinking well that's also human created in this disturbing way because we were the catalyst for coming back and i was like well there's the real q-tip <laughs> it's the water coming in you know um, it's a, a different cleansing um that that we caused and, and can't also create I have to say one final thing about the aerosol parasol jump too and, and it's also a connective tissue I think it's bringing, going yeah. back, I think to the beginning and the sort of manic human state that is, 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 is perceivable in that first film, even though it's more, it's lighter and it's like, it's more, um, it's more funny, but um, I feel like they, they, those two hold something very similar in terms of um, just like human mental activity. Um, yeah. It's a huge lyric essay. Really. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like we're focusing on the Q-tip and sterilization um, because with this concept of, of biopoiesis or um, self-generation or auto-generation, like that was happening right around the time that Louis Pasteur was trying to disprove the fact that flies sprang from rotten meat. I mean, that was one facet of biopoiesis or biogenesis. Um, so we have this concept of pasteurization uh, that made the world much better for us, but that kind of entrapped this fecundity. Like why shouldn't flies spring from rotting flesh? Um, why was that so earth shattering for us as human beings uh, to believe that we needed to disprove? Why was that so um, anxiety inducing in us? So I just, pasteurization and then just fecundity. Um, I, I love that idea of the Q-tip as the hinge upon which that falls. Yeah. yeah. And I think the sort of invisible Q-tip in um, Isabella's piece at the end is the fact that like almost all of Southern California's water supply comes from the North through the aqueducts. So yeah. yeah. So none of that landscape and all that lush like greenery wouldn't be possible with the water coming through the aqueducts. So I mean, in a weird way, it's like this human Q-tip of the aqueduct allowing for this wonderful landscape. But at the same time, it's like, why can't we just let it be desert? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm also thinking, um, so I've been reading a lot of Ursula lately, a lot of Le Guin. And in her novels, uh, humanity is almost always referred to as like 
young child or younger race, like just settle down young one and learn. And I, I think in this program, um, there's that constant vacillation of very unhealthy overvaluation and devaluation um, that we were kind of talking about just then. But this, we know everything, we know nothing, and just kind of striking that fine balance of taking um, and acknowledging our guilt and then learning to process in healthier ways. Um, we just need to go to like relationship counseling with the earth. And <laughs> deal with it. No, and I think a lot of it is like we, like humans, I think have an, I don't, I, it's not really a real complex, but I think we have an overcorrection complex maybe where I think, you know, we, we sense like, oh, this, this needs to be, or like, this can be rectified or this can be better. And then we go way too far and then that creates a new problem. And then mm -hmm. we go too far again. Um, and I think, you know, for me, um, I think CNN, when um, the, the tanker got stuck in the Suez Canal, um, <laughs> CNN had an interactive news article that said, like, can you guide a ship through the Suez Canal? And, like, I kept clicking, oh, like, rudder and, like, and, like, engine speed. And I kept overcorrecting and I kept crashing into and, like, getting the ship stuck every time. So I think in a weird way, yeah. So I think this is sort of a program that also is my navigating the Suez Canal a constant overcorrection? <laughs> yeah, giant container ship full of Q-tips. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I, I really, I really like how it, it feels that you have been just like curating in this larger sense, like mm -hmm. from program to like among the programs. Um, it's we, nice to to be able to notice that and to which yeah. we totally did like mm -hmm. we were like we're oh, like, oh and uh, there yeah. <laughs> we can see we can see the path um you know it's not like something overt that you're shoving in mm -hmm. the face but the nuances are just amazing um it's it's such a pleasure i know yeah. i'm really glad i just feel like another one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So yeah, it's been really nice to curate more in in fashion, something along those lines. <laughs> yeah, whoa. You, you just broke up that. in an amazing way. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, did it, what did it end up saying? It was more like it was a vocalization. It was a song. Yeah. Was really <laughs> um, but yeah, I was just saying it feels like we've been curating more in an omnibus. <laughs> or something along those lines. I'm sure the vocalization was better than the actual sentence. <laughs> oh, they're great in tandem. We could layer them over each other in editing. It'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> I love that atemporality. Perfect. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Rain, fog, and all. I made it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never would have known if you hadn't said anything. Nope. <laughs> you were uh, pointed as a Q-tip. <laughs> Getting in there. The woodland pattern Q-tip. <laughs> um, uh, what's it called? Um, a mascot. <laughs> Oh yeah, the Q-tip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, little googly eyes. It has to be done. It does. <laughs> All right, we'll stop. Okay. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Uh. Well. I guess we go. I guess we go now. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, good. Good night, everybody. Gardening, yeah. everyone. What'd you say? Happy gardening. Oh, thank you. Yes, and happy, Thanks. happy weekend, I hope, to all of you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this random cold spell in April, like I, for me, I haven't had a chance to put the seeds out into dirt yet because I saw the weather and I'm like, oh, I, that's just going to kill all of them. So hopefully mm -hmm. the weather is supposed to warm up a little bit late weekend. So maybe, maybe in the, yeah, Sunday I'll 
actually put some seeds in the dirt. Yeah, all of ours are in a little like contraption. Yeah, in a Q-tip. <laughs> <laughs> all right good night everybody good night uh